But one thing I do see constantly is when people are doing the things that God has designed them to do, angels are constantly partnering with them doing that thing. We've been focusing a lot on casting out the demonic, but there is a counter side to this, which is actually good. We, we want uh, angels and the angelic and the, the spiritual from God's side uh, invading our life. And with me today is Blake Healy. Uh, he's the author of The Veil, An Invasion of to the Unseen Realm, Profound God to See, uh, see God Through the Lens of His Love, and most recently, this, uh, Secular Sacred Spirit. Um, to see God's hand in every part of your life. Also, indestructible. Uh, you've got a lot of great books with us, Blake, and uh, you are dealing with uh, primarily the realm of the unseen. And so you are writing things to help people see the unseen. So let's talk about angels. Let's talk about the supernatural. So let me let me hear about yourself a little bit and then your experience with uh, with the unseen realm. Yeah, just a quick kind of you know crash course on on, on my story. Um, a, a big part of my testimony is that I've been uh, seeing angels, demons, and other spiritual things uh, since I was a little kid, really as far back as I can remember. Um, I see them with my eyes, not so differently from the way that I'm I'm seeing you right now. And uh, you know, uh, uh, when I was younger, I would just kind of see these things, didn't really have a context for them. From the age of nine to 12, I went through a period where I was seeing a lot of demonic things, especially at night, experienced mm -hmm. a lot of fear, a lot of kind of attack. And, and even though I uh, grew up in a Christian home, uh, my family, because of the church that we were going to, didn't really have a, con a context for that kind of active experience with with uh, really the supernatural in, in, in any kind of respect. And so, so you were I, talking I mean, about this at that age, too. You weren't you weren't being like, oh, this is just my imaginary friends and stuff like that. It, it, it's funny. So from from zero to nine, I it was I kind of call it like a period of mutual ignorance where I didn't mm -hmm. really realize that I was seeing anything out of the ordinary. And, and I don't think my parents knew that I was seeing anything out of the ordinary. You know, I would maybe get an odd look if I talked about the, the ladies that were dressed in gold dancing at church that day or, or a, a big black flying dog that I saw, you know, go, going over the thing. But I think my parents at that point just thought I had an active imagination. And I thought they were, you know, just as uninterested in the big black flying dog as they were in the, the fire truck and the you know mailbox that I also found very interesting, you know, um, and so now, as soon as I started experiencing that fear, um, I, I did realize there was something wrong. Like I, I felt really scared. I would see demonic things come in my bedroom every every night, and I would just feel more and more and more frightened. Um, but I, I, you know, I thought either the devil had decided to ruin my life, or that I was losing my mind. That it was that it was going crazy. You know, mm. um, it wasn't when I was twelve years old. We started. We, we moved across the country, and we started going to a new church that was really active about training people in the gifts of the spirit. And my mom took the whole family to a prophetic class uh, there. And it was really the first time I had ever heard anything that gave a grid to, to what I was experiencing. Mm -hmm. That obviously wasn't the exact same thing that they were teaching, but, but it gave me a context. It gave me a way to understand it. And so up until that point, I was too scared to tell my parents the full extent of what I was seeing. But after getting that piece of context, I, I finally was able to go and say, hey, I'm seeing this stuff. And and it was, it's interesting. As soon as I shared with them, they took me to go speak with some of the church leaders. And I heard about a gift that I had never heard of before at that point called seeing in the spirit. And, um, and as soon as I kind of switched from what my context had been up to that point, either the devil's trying to ruin my life or I'm going crazy. Mm -hmm. This, this third option appeared of maybe I just have been given a gift that I haven't learned how to manage yet. And for whatever reason, something in that recipe of, of sharing with someone else of, of realizing that I had maybe more authority in this circumstance than I had believed up until that point, uh, all of the fear uh, stuff completely stopped over the course of one week. Mm. Uh, didn't uh, all the uh, attacks stop the, the sense of fear when I would see those demonic things completely went away. And, um, ever since then, I've been working to, to understand the things I see more clearly, uh, to, uh, share them with others in a way that, that reveals God's nature, character, and, and, and who he is. And I invite other people to, to do the same. Yeah. So you, you take your experience and what you're seeing and you turn it to, letting people connect with God, the father, as opposed to angel worship, because that's something that 
we we hear about where people get infatuated with angels and you know there there is a definite intrigue but if you get infatuated with something that's not god you've actually made angel worship an idol um and that's mm-hmm. that's a problem so yeah yeah i was you know i was um i would get bothered even as a as 13 14 uh year, years old when People would seem almost, you know, over over focused on angelic things. And again, there's nothing wrong, just as you said, with being excited about it or or thinking that it's cool that that someone saw a vision of an angel, you know, chopping a demon's head off or, or something like that. There's nothing wrong with with being, you know, uh, excited by that or, or, or enjoying that. But again, it's it's that that priority of um, I've found as well that if you're trying to interpret that stuff by just by itself or just on its on its own, uh, we're, we're more likely to come to unhelpful conclusions. But when instead we're looking, how does this point to who God is? How does this mm-hmm. point to his nature? How does this point to his character? And try to interpret everything by him and toward him rather than just, just on its own. I, I found that that's where the real clarity and the real value tends to come from. Yeah. So Blake, um, let me ask you about this. You know, we read the Bible and we we see uh, several different instances where angels came with messages. Um, we've got, you know, obviously the angels speaking to Mary. Um, we've got the, you know, angel coming to Daniel. We, we know of, you know, Michael and Gabriel. Um, and we know that Lucifer was an, an archangel, but has been cast out and is now referred to as Satan, the devil. Um, mm-hmm. But we know that there's angelic host. There's like different types of of angels and different classifications, I guess. Mm-hmm. Could you kind of unpack some of that as you're reading scripture? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've run into a lot of books that try to create that kind of almost like taxonomy of, of, of angels categorization. And there is, there is some of it as evident in scripture and I'm, uh, and I, I don't begrudge anyone doing that and, and diving into that. I, I have personally found that it, it can edge on trying to trying to say more than the Bible saying mm. uh, uh, about about this, and it's funny because when when I do talk about this biblically with people, I've noticed that one of the things that at least I don't hear reflected back to myself very often is is some of the kind of broader picture narrative of of uh, God revealing this aspect of His kingdom to people, and it's kind of fascinating if you go through really all all of the, the books of the prophets, especially different. Mm-hmm. Uh, the book of Revelation, um, different, you know, kind of revelation moments all throughout the New Testament. Um, the word that's most often used, at least in the, in the Greek, is um, uh, actually uh, apocalypse. Now, uh, in modern language, apocalypse means like destruction or the end of the world right, or something right. like that. But the actual translation of that word is like an unveiling, a, mm-hmm. a, a revealing or a revelation. And, and it's almost this idea of people having these moments and there's again an equivalent word in uh, Hebrew that I'm not going to try to pronounce because I'm terrible at pronouncing Hebrew. Um, but it's, uh, it's this idea of almost God peeling back the veil and saying, here's what my, here's what mm-hmm. my kingdom looks like. Here's what the way the, the inner workings of how I'm operating. And it's, and then that's where you get these moments like Isaiah seeing this vision of the train of, of the Lord's robe filling the temple and just continuing going, going, going. That's this picture of God's authority and power operating in on the earth that his his uh, there's this uh, again, these pictures in, in uh, Ezekiel, Hosea of of um, God's throne being on this massive chariot, being pulled by these by these creatures, and it being kind of strange. There's these pictures of, you know, wheels within wheels. And, right, right. And I, you know, it, it's funny. Some of the things that I've I've see, seen, I kind of categorize broadly uh, this way: of you know, some things are more uh, designed to reveal the, the majesty, the mystery, the holiness, the, the bigness of, of God. And, and other things are designed to reveal the intimacy, the relatability, the, mm. the um, accessibility of, of God. To me, that's those extremes of, you know, again, seeing God's throne on a chariot covered in fire, you know, just these big, dynamic, um, overwhelming sort of images versus God showing up with a still small voice or an angel that looks, at least as I read the description in scripture, more or less like a person that, that mm-hmm. shows up and just relays a clear message. And 
I can share kind of two quick stories, at least from my own life, that, yeah, that kind of draw that picture. Um, so I remember I, I used to always see this one angel at our church. This was right after I learned that what I was experiencing was the result of a gift, and I was trying to you know, understand it to the best of my ability. And some stuff made intuitive sense. You know, I would see angels that would um, dance during worship. They'd be carrying banners. They'd be almost moving with a coordinated choreography, almost like they they knew what the music would be ahead of time and or just kind of partnering with the, with the worship that was happening there. And, mm. you know, again, that makes kind of intuitive sense. They're, they're partnering with us as we're, as we're worshiping God. They're, they're in, in uh, you know, partnering with that, that worship. Um, I would see sometimes maybe if we were praying for people, angels come by and lay their hands on people or, or remove things off of people. I remember one time our pastor was uh, preaching about uh, getting freedom in our lives. And I, again, as simple as it is, I saw angels with bolt cutters going yeah. around and cutting chains off of people. You know, again, it's very, very intuitive, you know, makes sense and, and you know, seems pretty clear. Um, and then another time I... I saw our, our pastor was praying for an impartation of the, the um, just the baptism of, of the Holy Spirit. And as, as he did, we had people lining up in the front. And I just saw this orangish, reddish, yellowish smear of light that was kind of solid and liquid and somewhat gaseous. Mm-hmm. And it came in, it swooshed through the people this way, swooshed through the people that way, and then went out the window. Hmm. I, I had no idea what that meant. That looked strange. It 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 looked very hard to to interpret and to understand. And so some stuff I would see uh, made intuitive sense. Like when I, I look at it, I can understand it. And some stuff, it would be kind of out there, you know. Um, and I remember I started to understand the difference between these two things with with a couple of experiences. Um, there was this one angel I'd always see that stood at the front door of our of our church. It's kind of the entry to the foyer and the, and the sanctuary. And, um, you know, uh, he, he looked like, uh, he was wearing this armor that was just immaculately taken care of in pristine condition. He had a spear in his hand. He was standing straight, you know, looking into the middle distance, mm-hmm. uh, looked like he was in his mid fifties. You know, I don't know if angels can be in their mid fifties, but that's, that's how, how he, how he looked. Now, everything about him looks like a, a guard, you know, or, mm-hmm. a, or a sentry or, or something of that nature, you know? So that's pretty intuitive. But as I was looking at that, I was like, okay, well, does that mean that he is going to like fight a, a demon if it tries to come in through through this door? Does that mean if that angel can overpower that demon, that God's plans or the enemy's plans come to fruition? And if that's the case, what, you know, again, I don't want to be rude, but what um, what extra benefit does an angel standing there have versus the presence of the Holy Spirit being being in our lives, the presence of God in, in the room as we worship him, being covered in the blood of Jesus? You know, what 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 extra protection would would that provide? And as I was running all these things through my mind, I saw this uh, short vision in, in the back of my mm-hmm. mind, which is like a short film that played on on the screen of my imagination. And in it, I saw these two kingdoms. And I saw the, the king of one kingdom send an ambassador to the foreign kingdom. And when he did, he sent this small honor guard, just a handful of soldiers to go with this ambassador. And mm-hmm. as this ambassador approached the foreign kingdom, I saw there was hundreds of soldiers on the walls of this kingdom. And when they entered the kingdom, there was even hundreds more inside. And at first I thought to myself, well, gosh, if that if those soldiers decided to attack, there's nothing that the, that honor guard would be able to do to protect. What's the what's the point? But in that same moment, I, I realized, oh, it's not just about the practical protection that that honor guard provides, even though that might be part of the reason. It's also just as much, if not more, about the statement that's being made, mm. that that this is a statement that that king is making. My power is going this with this person. This is representative of greater power that rests within my, my kingdom. And, and in that moment, it was... It's funny, the the angel looked exactly the same, but every detail of his appearance just suddenly took on deeper meaning. That that this idea that it wasn't just about the literal protection that would be provided, that angel fighting a demon if it came through, but but that, that again, that he was standing so straight, that he was so focused and intent on his task that I see would see him week after week unmoving, unflinching, you know, standing there, even th- that he looked like he was in his mid fifties spoke of, of age, of, of excellence, of, of, ma- of maturity of, of all these things. 
And so again, I realized, oh, it's one layer of, of a revelation of God's protection that he would, he would um, you know, anoint us with, with his son's blood, that we would be covered mm-hmm. in that way, that we would adopt it into his family. It's another layer of his protection that his presence would go with us. But it's another layer, a different flavor of the communication of his, mm-hmm. of his protection that he would send a servant to stand at the door and it would communicate something different about the value he had on what we were doing in that, in wow. that space. And so... So again, that stuff made intuitive sense, but it had this deeper meaning that it pointed to something. Yeah, I one other one other yeah. just kind of brief story to to wrap up some of that more abstract stuff is, um, I I remember one time because I would often see things that were abstract and strange and didn't make intuitive sense, and I didn't really you know know what to do with it. Um, we were doing an all night worship night, and I um. We, we walked in and I saw this, um, there was just a couple of people playing acoustic music and it was, you know, late, late in the night. And I saw just this kind of, again, just this greenish, whitish, uh, you know, bluish sort of smear of light that was in the center of the stage. And it was just kind of oscillating back and forth. Um, not in really any, to me, particular pattern. And I was frustrated at that point because I would see these abstract things. And I'm like, am I supposed to share this? Am I not supposed to share it? What does it mean if I do share it? Is it how, how is this helpful? How is this edifying? What does this mean? And, and you know, why, why am I seeing this if I don't know what to do with it? And so with a somewhat bad attitude, I, I sat down and was frustrated. And as I looked around the room, I saw this, this woman that was in the front row. She was probably in her late 80s. And she was kind of hunched over and, and leaning down. And I had this thought go through my mind, you know, at that time, I, I, and kind of the environment I was in had this really high value for really, um, uh, really extravagant worship. And that when we worship God, there was a real value for, for not being ashamed of being, you know, displaying your, your love for the Lord, whether that's moving around or just being kind of more outgoing. But I realized that that good value had kind of put a bit of a negative mindset in me where I felt this internal judgment towards this woman pop up in my mind of, oh, I guess she's not that engaged in worship right now. Um, and as soon as I had this thought, I felt this sense of conviction. And then immediately I looked in the spirit and I could see straight through her. I could see her skeleton. I could see her internal organs. And then my eyes kind of settled on her heart. And when I saw her heart, I saw this greenish, bluish, whitish little smear of light that was uh, pumping through the four chambers of her heart back and forth in this pattern and an exact replica in, in miniature of the one that I saw on the stage. And as I looked around the room, I saw that exact same light in every heart in, inside the room. And I immediately heard the Holy Spirit say, I'm, I'm sinking their heartbeats to mine. And so, and so it's interesting because I, I, so I suddenly got a little bit more meaning out of this thing that was abstract. I got a little bit of a correction about an attitude that I had, but at the same time, I'm sinking their heartbeats to mine. What does that mean? What does that, what does that literally mean? And the more I've thought about it over the years, I realize again, there, there's things that are more tangible and practical of, about God that are relatable about him. And there are things that he does that are mysterious, that are hard to define, that are that are hard to to express clearly, and and are in fact mysterious. Often, I think sometimes we we see things in the spirit that are more reflective of the mystery of who he is, and then other things that are more related to the to the um, tangibility of who he is. So that, that was a very long answer to a short question. <laughs> that, that's great, though. <laughs> and any any answer that I can get a story out of, I'm I'm happy with. Uh, yeah. you know, there, there's a couple of things that I want to make sure that we touch on here, and that's guardian angels, um, mm-hmm. the the ability to command angels, mm-hmm. and interacting with angels as well. Mm-hmm. You know, you you mentioned that you were a kid whenever you realized that this was a, a gift. Uh, you you kind of came to that that matrix and understanding, um, mm-hmm. but have you interacted with them? I could just imagine seeing, you know, eight, nine year old Blake just saying, Hey, Mr. Angel, how's it going today? You know, like <laughs> how have you interacted with them? If so, what was that like? Yeah. So I, it's interesting. I, um, when I was younger, I, for the most part, didn't feel this compulsion to, to naturally interact with, with angels. But the best way I can explain it is, you know, I, if I was at school or at church or something like that, I would naturally interact with my parents and 
I generally wouldn't interact with someone else's parents unless they engaged me for the most mm. part. And that's really just because of an intuitive sense of belonging, of, of order, if, if you will, you know, and, and I could really, uh, looking back, I can really see how I could feel that, that, um, very organic sense of order with regard mm. to the angelic things that I saw, especially that there is a, you know, if, if there's, there's a lot of, you know, sh characteristics that just about every angel I've seen is carried, but if there's two that really stand out, it's the, the intentness with which they do and value whatever task they've been assigned. And also their, um, their very, very strong sense of respect for mm -hmm. the, the relationships and, and roles that they, that they have. Um, and so a, um, you know, a quick example is, as you kind of were, we're talking about of, of, you know, every person I've ever met has, has what I call a personal angel, an angel. Some people call them guardian angels, mm -hmm. just a, an angel that is, that is with them, you know, all, all throughout their life. And one question I'll common, commonly get asked is, you know, does, uh, you know, if people get, get married, do, do their angels like interact? Do they, do they work together? And well, I've seen examples of that for the most part, I see that angel still be focused mainly on that person, that, mm -hmm. that they're, they're one person and remain just really, really focused on just partnering with the purposes of God and, and that individual's life. And again, not that, not that that would be wrong or, or different for it not to be, but it's just that, that kind of focus of, of relationship. And so I actually didn't ever hear an angel speak until I was um, in my, in my twenties. Um, really? Yeah, I would see them all the time, but I never heard anything auditory whatsoever until I was in until I was in my twenties. Hmm. And you know, it's interesting. I, I I've met a lot of other people who see in the spirit who have had kind of slightly different experiences, and I, I think even some of it might might be due to my my personality. My personality is a little bit more of a observational one. I like to look and see what's going on, try to understand things, and and kind of. Um, even occasionally be maybe a little bit more disconnected and, and observational as a, as I said. And so it could be some of that. Um, I noticed for me personally that as I've grown in authority and responsibility in different ministry roles, um, throughout my life, I have noticed that there's been, th that the interaction with angels has increased, uh, in those regards that, if, I, if there's a specific message for a ministry that I'm serving, a mm. a church that I'm ministering at, um, direction for the, the church where 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 I serve now, um, things like that. That's that's where I'll run into that kind of conversation a little bit more. And you know, it's interesting. This this conversation of commanding angels does come up quite quite frequently, and right. I've heard um, you know. Uh, if not passionate, at least, uh, 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 strong arguments for either perspective of, of you should absolutely not command angels. You absolutely should be command commanding angels. And I, my experience would communicate something a little bit in the middle. I, um, my, my kind of rule of thumb is, uh, one of the most beautiful facets of the gospel is, is that Jesus is our own only intermediary between uh, us and and the father mm. and and of course he he is the father in 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 essence and so one of the the thing that again is so beautiful about the gospel is that we have actually been invited into a relationship with god and yeah. without intermediary and i think i have seen angels very much respect that reality that that they don't exist as an intermediary. They exist as a, a servant of the kingdom of God who is partnering with his purposes and his purposes in our lives as, as well. Mm -hmm. And so I do hesitate to do anything that would put an angel between me and the Lord or feel like I have to, you know, do this, but or rather than that. Um, however, one thing I do see constantly is when people are doing the things that God has designed them to do, angels are constantly partnering with them doing that thing. Now that can be traditional ministry things that we think of like leading worship or preaching or praying for folks or, mm. you know, th things of that nature. But it's also in the, all the other, uh, we don't always think of them this way, but the, the, the godly things that we're called to in our life, like, uh, working and, yeah. and, uh, operating in our families, uh, interacting with others in, in, in the world, in our shopping experiences, you know, in, in, in commerce, in our day-to-day -day lives that, 
And, and again, many of us are called to, to be in the world, bringing God's kingdom to those, to what we think of as non-ministry areas, even mm-hmm. though that the, the whole world belongs to God and, yeah. and, and do, uh, doing anything good in the world is an expression of, of, uh, God's kingdom. And so, um, so I see angels constantly partnering with that. And so it's, it's an interesting interaction of, to me, it's almost a moot question in some ways of, uh, am I supposed to be commanding angels? I almost think in some ways that's the wrong question of uh, if I'm partnering with the purposes of God in my life, he is undoubtedly prepared and sent angels to partner with those purposes in, in my life. And Amen. so rather than being too concerned about, should I tell an angel to do that? Um, I, I think it's more uh, uh, an aspect of um uh, you know, should, should I be doing that? Should I be stepping in, out in authority in this, in this particular area? Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of nuanced cases in that, but uh, I think that overall perspective and attitude, that's, that's the one I've found to be the most, most helpful. I love how you explain that because that's how I, that, that's actually kind of what I've, what I've been saying and, and thinking for a long time. If I'm partnering with what God has called me to do, then he's, <laughs> then I get those benefits that come along with that partnership. Um, mm-hmm. and that includes, the angels and I don't need to be commanding them because they know what to do better than I do. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, that's, that's something that I've been finding interesting. I've been hearing a lot of people talking, you know, saying, you know, you know, we send these angels to go this way or that way. And it's like, I, I don't know exactly where they're getting that. Um, I know that it's a great, it's a great thought. I guess it makes people feel mm-hmm. good. Um, I, I don't, I don't know exactly. I, I'm sure there's times where that, that that might that might work, and you're partnering mm-hmm. with God, and as you're saying what God said to say, then mm-hmm. He sends them. But if you're saying that in your own strength, then you're not partnering with God. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think God just kind of sits back sits back and 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 chuckles a little bit at some of our uh, <laughs> our charismania sometimes. But <laughs> certainly, certainly, yeah. And I, I, you know, I'm of the I'm of the attitude that I, I you know, I think. I don't want anyone to be out there feeling too scared of like, oh, did I say the wrong thing? Did I do yeah. that. I, I think, you know, God is gracious. And I think every human being on this planet has said the wrong thing at the wrong time. <laughs> I mean, yeah, me know. too. I, definitely. And, I'm one of them. You know, you only need to look at the disciples for five minutes and see like, oh, Peter's chopping people's ears off at the wrong time. You know, mm-hmm. Peter's like, oh, let's build a temple to this here. You know, it's, yeah. it's, you know, we, we make mistakes like that sometimes and that's, that's okay. And, but at the same time, I do think we need to be sensitive to the adjustment of the Holy Spirit and and feedback from our environment, you know, yeah. as, as challenging as that can be, because that's often imperfect, too. But if we're not sensitive to those things, we can kind of end up fighting and dying on these hills that, that may not be worth fighting and dying on. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's good to kind of look at the heart of that. You know, Blake, there's um, there's a scripture that talks about, the, you know, we entertain angels unaware. Um, you know, almost like plain clothes, undercover angels. And <laughs> yeah. I, I feel that I've had experiences like that, uh, mm-hmm. looking back where in the moment you're just kind of like, what is going on? Um, mm-hmm. I was on a mission trip in Israel, uh, sharing the gospel to somebody and, um, we were having a debate there about who mm-hmm. Jesus is. And, uh, this random person came up, yeah. gave us this dark Russian chocolate, which was delicious. Um, mm-hmm. And he, he, he said, what are you guys talking about? And we, we briefly, briefly explained, and he just turned to us and that, and the person we were ministering to, and he said, Jesus is the only Messiah. And then he just turns and walks away and I lose him in the crowd and I don't see him. And so I'm like, God, I don't know if that was an angel or not, or just somebody that, you know, this just happens to love Jesus that it mm-hmm. also loves dark chocolate. Uh, mm-hmm. But, um, <laughs> And was willing to share. I mean, that's that was a blessing. But uh, yeah. Uh, but one of the things that I've always wanted is to see the angelic. You know, and I, mm-hmm. I just was looking up here, Second Kings chapter six. You know, you have Elisha and his servant, and they're surrounded mm-hmm. by these by the enemy army. And um, Elisha says to his servant, "Don't be afraid. The army that fights for us is larger than the army that fights for Aram." Then Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I ask you, open my servant's eyes so that he can see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and the servant who saw the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. They were all around Elisha. Mm -hmm. Um, Elisha prayed that his servant's eyes were opened uh, so that he Mm -hmm. could see that. Um, Is that a, 
is that a prayer that we can pray today as well? Mm-hmm. Like, because I I've wanted to see this my whole life, and I'm sure everybody that's watching this, uh, if you haven't seen an angel, you've wanted to. Uh, so, mm-hmm. is this something that we could that we can still pray today? Yeah, absolutely. I, I absolutely believe believe that with my whole heart, and I often host, you know, uh, myself uh, workshops and trainings and, and things like that to try to activate this gift because I. At least for myself, it's funny. I, I remember the very day that I learned that what I was experiencing was the result of a gift. I, I It came with internally this just immediate conviction that it was something that was meant to be available for every Christian. You know, yeah. at, at that time, I didn't have a theological reason for that. I didn't really have anything other than just this instinctual belief that it was it, that it wasn't just a, a special gift that I had, but a, a thing that was just available to, to, to any Christian. And, you know, over, over the years... Um, I've, I've worked with, uh, we, uh, I helped uh, lead a ministry school here at uh, Bethel Atlanta for, for many, many years and worked with a lot of students there in, in doing that. And it's, it's interesting because I've had every experience where I've had it, where we've prayed that uh, prayer very similar to the one that was, uh, prayed in second Kings six. And immediately the person starts seeing in the spirit, you know, and those, those moments are, uh, astounding, exciting and, and fun. And then I've had other times where, Someone has kind of practiced and, and honed, and, and I'll kind of talk about the difference there in just a second. And um, over the course of a week, all of a sudden started singing the Spirit. Hmm. I've had students that have uh, intensely pursued it for three years and uh, gotten breakthrough then. And I have, and then I've had people who have been pursuing it pretty, pretty uh, uh, regularly for a long period of time and still have not gotten breakthrough in in that area. And so. One of the ways I like to look at this is there's kind of two, um, if you will, mechanisms at, at play, at least in, in my experience. Um, we can, you know, the, the scripture talks about discerning of spirits, and we can think of that simply as discerning what's good, discerning what's bad. Mm-hmm. I think that's maybe a simple version of discerning of spirits, but it can be discerning, okay, what, what is God doing? How is he doing it? What's what's the actual nature of this of this spiritual reality that we're, that we're in right now? You know, it can be kind of more refined than just good or bad. Um, and so, uh, we talked earlier about this idea of apocalypse a, right. and, and again, that is a, a revelation moment. And, um, I believe that the gifts of the spirit are, they're given to us freely and they're, it's almost like, a, I'm going to steal this uh, example that Eric Johnson uses that I really like. He said, the gifts of God are, are like a, um, are like a keyboard, like a piano keyboard. You know, it's, it's there. I give it to you. And, and every sound that it can make, every note that it can play is already there. It's, mm-hmm. it's complete. Now it does take exercise, discipline, refinement to learn how to get those sounds out and to, to hear a sound in your head and to be able to make it come out of that piano. Um, and so you're not pursuing these things with discipline, with intentionality, with purpose to try to earn the gift, but instead to try to learn to use a gift that you've been, you've been given. Mm. And so we can, uh, you know, learn tools, learn keys to exercise our discernment, to refine our discernment, to familiarize ourselves with these gifts, with these senses that God has given us. Um, now, um, th- th- those apocalypse moments where God lifts the veil, where he just opens the door. And when yeah. I, when I pray for people and they start seeing right away, it feels like that there's and in my own life, there's things that I feel like are the results of a gift that God has uh, just over many, many years, exercised this discernment and learned, learned how to use it more and more and more. And even still there's moments where it's like, I wouldn't have even known how to look for this or how to understand it, whatever, but you just tore the veil open and showed mm-hmm. me this thing that's going on. Um, those we, we can't make happen. We can't. Uh, and those are, in my view, those are just completely by the will of God mm-hmm. and, and with his intention and purpose. I, I do think that refining our discernment um, conditions our mind to be ready and aware for an apocalypse, for, mm-hmm. for, for a moment of revelation, that the more that we can um, exercise those muscles, refine our mind, um, think with the language of heaven, you know, that we can be more sensitive to those moments because some of them, I think it can be those dramatic pull open the the veil moments, but they also right. can be those, those still small voice moments that invite us into something bigger. And so, mm-hmm. um, so again, I, I encourage every Christian to, you know, to find ways and tools of, of refining our discernment or finding our ability to hear God's voice or finding our, uh, our understanding of all, all the gifts of the spirit. But then recognize that there, there are these things that, that are outside our control, that, that are completely unreliant on God um, opening something up. Now, I, I, I do believe 
God wants to do that with every Christian. Mm. I think that, and those can be those moments where you see something, those can be those moments where all of a sudden you just understand something about God or understand how much he loves us, where he, it's, you know, I think, again, I think all of us, I, don't, I think even salvation itself is in some ways an apocalypse, a moment where it's like, absolutely, I just suddenly realize, oh, this is, this is what I need. This is, this is, this is who he is, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, but I, I, again, I believe those are things that are meant to be a normal uh, or a consistent part of, of our Christian walk. Amen. Amen. Blake, would you, as we're wrapping up here, would you pray for that, for the people that are watching to have that activation? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. So Lord, I just, I just pray a blessing on any person watching this or watching a, re- a recording later, Lord, that just, um, that first Lord, I just, I just pray a blessing on their discernment on their, on their gift that you have given them of discerning of spirits, Lord, that, that they, and I just uh, affirm that they already are sensitive to the spirit, that they, they are sensitive to, to, to what is of, of the spirit of God and what is of any other spirit. And that those senses can be refined. They can be clarified. They can be, um, they can be tuned and that you can grow, um, even more rich in your understanding with those, with those, with every one of those senses. So I just pray a blessing that those will grow. And I just release an impartation of, of the history of, of exercising this gift that, uh, I just release that, that as a momentum to every single person uh, that's watching right now. And then also, Lord, I just, I just invite that moment of apocalypse, that moment of revelation. We, Lord, we want to, we want to see you for who you are. We want anything that you want to reveal uh, of yourself to us, Lord. We want to be open to, we want to be ready to see, we want to be ready for uh, you to reveal yourself to be bigger than we understood, to be uh, more beautiful than we understood, to be more powerful than we understood, Lord. We want to have that moment where that only you can create, where you open up the veil, where you reveal a piece of your kingdom or a piece of yourself to, to us, Lord. And I just, um, I just ask that the eyes of our heart would be open, Lord. And then also, Lord, I, I ask that we would begin to identify, it'd be easy for us to identify those apocalypse moments that we've already had in our history that maybe we just dismissed as just a feeling or just an idea that we would see them as true revelations of, of who you are. And so I just bless those, those two facets of, of our Christian experience, Lord, that we would grow in our discernment and we'd have these, these moments of revelation, these moments of apocalypse. We just ask that in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Blake Healy, thank you so much for for being here on Charisma News and to talk about angels, the angelic, the unseen realm that uh, God wants to reveal to us, but uh, at the right time. And we need to be ready whenever he does open those up for us because, um, you know, you have experiences in the Bible where people fall down and and start worshiping. And we don't want that because... We're supposed to worship Jesus. We're supposed to worship God the Father um, and not the angels. And so it, one of the things that is that is encouraging is whenever we hear an angel speak, most of the time they're saying, fear not. You know, don't be afraid of those situations. Be yeah. ready. Be prepared. And uh, search the scriptures after those experiences as well. Mm-hmm. So, Absolutely. And I want to encourage everybody, if you uh, were blessed by this interview, write in the comments. Let us know what what God was speaking to you through Blake and what he was sharing. And also, if you've seen angels, let us know. We want to, we want to hear about that. We want to encourage other people. And uh, thank you so much for watching. And if you go to My Charisma Shop, you can get Blake's books, uh, Indestructible, uh, Fight Your Spiritual Battles from the Winning Side, The Veil, uh, An Invitation to the Unseen Realm, Profound God, See God Through the Lens of His Love, and See God's Hand in Every in every Part of Life Through Secular, Sacred Spirit uh, by Blake Healy. So those are the four great books, and you can get those at My Charisma Shop there. And uh, Blake, thanks so much for being here on Charisma News. Oh, thanks so much for having me. From 1975, Charisma has been at the forefront of reporting on revival, miracles, and the move of God in our world. Charisma Magazine is now going exclusively online to reach beyond the physical barriers of a print issue. Charisma Magazine Online is committed to bringing you the very best spirit-led content to inspire your walk with God in this upside-down world. Go to MyCharisma.com for exclusive content today.